you have no idea of the true power a dragon boy can leave. The traitor's eyes burned behind a mask wrought from gold. Incandescent fury flaring from the narrow slits of his visage, like the vents of a dwarven forge. This mask had been a gift from the dragon overlords, but now it was warped by its wearer's treacherous affiliation with the Abyssal Cephaliarch. From atop his grand temple, an architectural wonder that proclaimed his preeminence in the eternal language of stone, the first dragonborn watched his rival ascend the stairs. The dragon priests had chosen Varlok for their champion, and had given him the honour of donning the horned mask, Konarik. Warlord. But Mirak wavered not. Varlok could have brought every dragon priest in Skyrim with him. It made no difference. Not only did Mirak have the allegiance of Azadal, Sakrisos, and Dukan, but with three words Gol Ha Dove, Earth Mine Dragon, the first dragonborn could bend the will of the worms which circled above, drawn like moths to the flame of this consequential clash. Varlok ascended the final step, and placed the Warlord mask over his expressionless face. <gasps> Spikes of jagged power erupted from Marak's form, and he drew his apocryphal weapons. Spheres of magicka coalesced in the hands of the silent champion, and on the steps of the traitor's temple, a calamitous duel commenced. Thousands of years have passed since that momentous confrontation, yet the aftershock lingers within the terrestrial bones of Solstheim. The Skarl custodians of the land maintain a legend of this ancient battle, preserved by the frigid winds of oral tradition. They call this legend the Guardian and the Traitor, and it says that the two fought a mighty battle that lasted for days, each hurling terrible arcane energies and fum shouts at the other. So great and terrible were the forces unleashed in this contest, that Solstheim was torn apart from the mainland of Skyrim. In truth, precious little is known of this clash. Did Merak fight alone, or did he assemble an army of brainwashed dragons? Did Varlok fight alone, or did he bring the united clergy of loyal dragon priests to aid him? Did he wear the legendary warlord mask Konarik, endorsed by the eight highest ranking priests? The latter question will not be answered today, for Konarik is a beast of its own, but we can speculate about the rest, and we will in this video. What we do know is that the mighty Mirak inevitably fell from grace, and was killed by the very prince who saved him all those ages ago. A great deal transpired over these errors, but I believe it was one grave mistake that assured the first Dragonborn's downfall, and today we're going to explore it, as well as what it really means to be Dragonborn. The duel between Merak and Varlok is said to have sundered the land beneath their feet, the arcane violence rupturing the northern hinterlands of Chill. The snows plummeted through this great fissure, vanishing in Nern's gaping maw. And as Nern yawned ever wider, the rushing tides of the Sea of Ghosts hastily filled her, forming a new strait and giving birth to the island of Solstheim. Were these dragon priests powerful enough to reshape the continent, or was this an embellishment on the part of the Skarl? There are plenty of terraforming calamities documented in Tamrielic history, though these tend to be mythological in nature, or too foreign to be verified such as the sinking of Yakuda by the dreaded Pancrato sword, or the deluge that sank Old Meris. According to the Pocket Guide to the Empire 3rd edition, when the hero dirge of Yakuda were defeated, they had their revenge on the entire land, destroying what they would never rule. And in regards to Old Meris, the guide states, some say that Old Meris was sunk into the sea by the angry gods of the Old Mer. Alas, the extent of the destruction wrought by Merak and Varlok will remain enshrouded by the mists of history. But as any storyteller will assure you, when gathered around the campfire at night, there is no smoke without fire. Little is known of Merak prior to this conflict. Most of his story was delayed by the dilation, or dissipation altogether, of time in Apocrypha, 
but Mirak was the most formidable member of the dragon cult. This cult of dragon priests existed for one purpose, and that was to carry out the will of the dragons. Fundamentally, being a dragonborn, Mirak was always a danger to this purpose. So when the tales of Varlok and Mirak refer to the Guardian and the Traitor, these titles are quite subjective. A traitor to the dragons may not be a traitor in the eyes of men, and the motivations of the gods involved are not so easily defined. So let us defy the dragon and rewind a little. When the Nords sailed from Atmora to the shores of Skyrim, they faced many hardships. Firstly, there was the Murish matter, for amicable relations with the resident Snow Elves inevitably frayed and unraveled into all-out war. The Nords eventually emerged victorious from this conflict, but their sovereignty would not be secure so long as they knelt before the dragons. You see, it had always been deeply ingrained in Atmoran culture to revere the totem of the dragon. Nordic spirituality depicts the pantheon of gods as animals. Shor the fox is the chief of their religion, but Shor is dead, at least as far as they know. Of all the animal totems, one rose to the top of their culture, and that totem was the dragon. Alduin the World Eater. Alduin was the Nordic form of Auriel, the god of time and harbinger of the apocalypse. He was not necessarily superior to the other Nordic gods, but because the dragons were prevalent in the Merefic times, and due to their dominant dispositions, it was easy to place themselves at the forefront of Nordic culture. According to the text titled, The Dragon War, dragons being dragons embraced their role as god kings over men. After all, were they not fashioned in Akatosh's own image? Were they not superior in every way to the hordes of small soft creatures that worship them? For dragons, power equals truth. They had the power, so therefore, it must be truth. Alduin in the Nordic pantheon is their equivalent to Auriel, and they believe that the Kalpic cycle is perpetuated by the Black Dragon. When the time is right for the Old World to die, and the New World to begin, Alduin manifests on Tamriel. There is no mercy, no bargaining, only a horrible, ravaging firestorm, burning with such intensity that it creates a gale of wind powerful enough to drive the Mundus from one Kalpa to the next. So when Alduin made his presence known, and decried himself as the firstborn son of Akatosh Auriel, only to cast aside his duty and indulge his avaricious aspirations, a time of confusion gripped the North. The Nords genuflected before their draconic overlords, for there was no denying their might. But the confusion, combined with the oppressive state of affairs, threatened to boil over at any point. The dragons may well have been aware of this simmering resentment, but why should they care? Humans were simple to subjugate, and they didn't even need to take an active role in rulership. The Dragon War text goes on to say, Dragons granted small amounts of power to the dragon priests in exchange for absolute obedience. In turn, the dragon priests ruled men as equals to the kings. Dragons, of course, could not be bothered with actually ruling. The dragons had used their biological superiority to justify their tyranny over the Nords, and there was nothing the frail humans could do about it. In the words of Parfanax, Dov Walan Farel, we were made to dominate. The will to power is in our blood. And due to the Nordic reverence for the dragon totem, this hierarchy might have endured for a very long time but the rise of the dragon cult certainly hastened the growing unrest. By instating some men to command the rest, selecting favourites among equals, the seeds of sedition were bound to burgeon. The dragon priests were not benevolent rulers, and took far too much inspiration from their masters. This could have just been due to the intensity of their devotion, but I'd chalk it up to the unavoidable propensity for all sapient beings to vie for power and to ultimately be corrupted by the possession of it. The Dragon War elaborates on the gradual shift in how the Dragon Priests governed. In Atmora, where Isgrimor and his people came from, the Dragon Priests demanded tribute and set down laws and codes of living that kept peace between dragons and men. In Tamriel, they were not nearly as benevolent, 
it's unclear if this was due to an ambitious dragon priest, or a particular dragon, or a series of weak kings. Whatever the cause, the dragon priests began to rule with an iron fist, making virtual slaves of the rest of the population. At this point, the dragons must have felt foolish for entrusting so much power in the hands of such weak creatures. But the Nordic people soon reached breaking point. When the populace rebelled, the dragon priests retaliated. When the dragon priests could not collect the tribute or control the masses, the dragon's response was swift and brutal. So it was the Dragon War began. Mirak's involvement in this war, or his lack thereof, will prove crucial to his story. But it was before the conflict broke out that Mirak turned against his kind. It was not a case of empathy for the subjugated masses, but purely for personal gain. All Nords have an innate connection to the Fum, the Storm Voice. It is fundamental to their nature. Nords refer to themselves as the Children of the Sky, believing that the Goddess of Sky and Storm, Kynes' breath upon the throat of the world, brought them to life. Therefore, the ability to channel the Voice is not unique among Nords. It is, however, rare to find a Nord of such talent and discipline to wield its full potential. When the Nords began to use the voice isn't quite so clear. Some sources suggest that it can be traced back to Atmora. Others claim the Dragon Priests were the first to wield it, perhaps bestowed upon them by the dragons as a reward for their servitude. Alternatively, the etched tablets of High Hrothgar assert that Kain called upon Parfenax, who pitied man, Together they taught men to use the voice. Kine bade Parfenax to give this gift to her sky children during the war against Alduin's tyranny. The ability for Nords to use the Fum almost certainly predates the Dragon War, but there is no doubt that Parfenax would have made it considerably easier for more men to understand how to utilize it. Whatever the case, one thing is clear. Mastery of the voice was no easy feat for a human's inferior vocal cords. Mirak was the first dragonborn. This meant that he could devour the souls of slain dragons and learn powerful shouts instantly. He was tremendously, uniquely powerful in his time. And these enhanced abilities led Mirak to consider himself mighty enough to rival the dragons, not serve them. He craved more power, more knowledge, more of the dragon language that his masters had withheld from him. And so, he turned to the Keeper of Forbidden Knowledge, Hermaeus Mora. No mortal prior to this point had dared to strike an accord with the Abyssal Cephaliarch. And Moran folk tales told of Herma Mora, the woodland man, and warned men against his seduction. But Merak was brazen, and struck a deal with the Gardener of Men, becoming the Prince's champion in exchange for Forbidden Knowledge granting him powers unknown to the other priests and all the dragons of the north. From Mora's leather-bound labyrinth, Merak uncovered never-before-spoken words in the Dover tongue. He could take on the aspect of a dragon, and most significant of all, he could bend dragons to his will. This was the height of impiety to the draconic overlords. As Parfenax said, dragons were made to dominate, and as the Dragon War text states, they embraced their role as god kings over men, for they were superior and fashioned in the image of Bormahu, or Auriel, or Alduin, or Akatosh, whatever you choose to call the fractured dragon god of time. Mirak slew dragons with ease, absorbing their souls and channeling them into words of power. Parfenax says, there is nothing else but philosophy to Adova. It is no accident that we do battle with our Thum, our voices. There is no distinction between debate and combat to a dragon. Timvak Loskra. For us, it is one and the same. And if dragons pride themselves on the cutting edge of their rhetoric, then Merak proved himself to be the master debater. Another testament to the might of Merak in those early days of mankind is that one of his acolyte priests was none other than Azadal. I have a video on the channel about Azadal that makes a case for why he just might be the greatest mage who ever lived, which I'll link in the description. 
So, for him to be considered an acolyte of Marak just goes to show that Marak's command of the Storm Voice must have been astounding. Marak and his acolyte priests were obviously no longer welcome among the priests of the Dragon Cult, and they operated on the outskirts of Skyrim, in the Solstheim region. Of course, we don't know whether Solstheim was part of the mainland at this point, or whether the story of its sundering was a tall tale espoused by the Skarl. Whatever the case, Marak would have undermined the dragons and their manservants from his temple in the northeast, and he would have feared no challenger. When the Dragon War commenced, and the Nordic masses rebelled against their scaled superiors, Marak made the decision not to participate. Maybe he saw no opportunity to capitalize on the conflict. Maybe allowing the two parties to annihilate each other amused him. Or, as I suggested in my recent video on Hermaeus Mora, Perhaps the scryer of the Tides of Fate counseled him to stay out of the unfolding strands of destiny. In the latter case, my argument was that Mora had an ulterior motive, one that relied on him keeping Mirak from fulfilling his true purpose in life. We'll explore this very soon, but the important thing to take away from this is that I believe Mirak's neutrality in this dragon war was the one grave mistake that assured his doom. He might have delayed it, living longer than any man could ever hope to live, but his fate was sealed with that seemingly inconsequential decision. When the war began, the men died in droves. The Nords were formidable warriors, there were many talented tongues, and at this time, before magic was shunned by their culture, they also had a great number of powerful mages called clever men. And though they outnumbered the dragons, it took many men to slay even a weaker dragon. To make matters worse, the dragon priests had been carefully selected by the dragons, for they were men of immense power and influence, and each priest had a horde of followers. According to a report on the nature of dragons, called There Be Dragons, they just were, and are, eternal, immortal, unchanging, and unyielding. They are not born or hatched, they do not mate or breed. Dragons are fundamentally different to the descendants of the Elnafe, to men and myrrh. They can be killed, their physical bodies destroyed, but you cannot permanently kill a dragon so long as its soul remains. Dragons can absorb the souls of other dragons that they defeat in battle, and this is the only way to ensure the rival soul does not reconnect with its corpse. With this in mind, there was no way for men to win the war. They could delay the threat, but victory could not be secured. Some dragons defected to the side of men, like Parthenax, who taught new words to the most powerful tongues. But unless these few dragons could absorb the souls of all their kin, Alduin's armies would simply regenerate and rally again. Understandably, the inner councils of men were hesitant to trust Parthenax and the other turnscales, so it was difficult for men to provide consistent assistance. Also, Parthenax had been Alduin's lieutenant, but ultimately, Alduin was the first, and the greatest. Alduin, destroyer, devourer, master. If Alduin's soul could not be consumed, then the war could not end. If only there were a legendary dragonborn, a champion of mankind powerful enough not only to defeat Alduin, but to absorb his life essence, and end the world-eating peril once and for all. This was Marak's purpose. Harkon One-Eye, a great warrior, whose place in Sovngarde's Hall of Valor awaited him, walked, sailed to Solstheim, and sought an audience with the renegade dragon priest. With Marak by their side, Alduin would have a genuine reason to be afraid. His debate tactics could be countered. Marak believed he was perfectly capable of defeating the World Eater in his own words, spoken to his prophetic heir far into the future. So you have slain Alduin. Well done. I could have slain him myself back when I walked the earth. But I chose a different path. So when Harkon came to Marak's temple, he was bitterly disappointed, and surely shocked by the dissident's decision not to fully commit to the betrayal of his former dragon masters. And he would be right because there are plenty of reasons why Marak would have benefited from aiding the Nords. From the way he speaks, to the way he controls the minds of weak-willed mortals, there's no doubt Marak relishes in his power, 
and with the blood of dragons running through his veins, he shares their merciless ambition and drive to dominate. So how could he possibly pass up the opportunity to defeat the greatest living dragon? He could remove his most significant rival while being venerated across the north. The Nords would certainly have accepted Marak as their leader. Not to mention the wealth of knowledge Marak would obtain from absorbing the soul of the World Eater. I can only conceive of one reason why Marak would choose not to intervene, and that's if he received a better offer. That offer, I believe, came from Hermaeus Mora. And my theory is that the Gardener of Men wished to manipulate the threads of fate by luring Marak away from his designated life path. By derailing the destiny of the first Dragonborn, a fate vacuum was created. Someone needed to stop Alduin, for reasons we'll discuss very soon. And if Marak wandered off to Apocrypha, then a future Dragonborn would have to inherit his responsibility. But before we delve deeper into this future Dragonborn, and Mora's motive, and the effect this would all have on Marak, let's tackle the slippery subject of what it means to be Dragonborn. There is often confusion over the distinction between the Nordic Dragonborn heroes and their connection to the pagan Nordic pantheon versus the Dragonborn emperors of Cyrodiil. But beneath the surface, these legendary figures can all be traced back to the will of one god, the most important god in the Mundus, whether he's dead or alive. And we all know who that god is, whatever guise he takes. Some call him Shaw, others Lorcan. A few even know him by an antithetical name, a man in a dragon mask, Akatosh. So, what is a dragonborn? To be Doverkin, dragonborn, is to be blessed with the blood and soul of a dragon, to possess the same innate connection with the law of time as imposed by Akatosh. An acolyte of Merun's Dagon, named Vonos, refers to the dragonborn and all dragons as fragments of Akatosh's soul. And there is a theory I've discussed in the past that Akatosh is insane, shattered like an hourglass cast from the summit of the snow throat. Dragons, as well as the many variations of the archetypical god, variations like Auriel, Akatosh, Alduin, who all seem to represent different worldviews, are all shards of the Akka Oversoul. That's certainly quite a rabbit hole that warrants future plumbing. But for now, let's just say that a dragonborn soul and lifeblood are infused with the dragon god of time's eternal power. Interestingly, Merak existed as a dragonborn far before the founding of the god we call Akatosh. And that's due to the fact that Akatosh is a Cyrodiilic deity. Before the birth of Elysia's empire, there was Alduin the World Eater of the Nordic Pantheon, and Auriel the Eagle, king of the Old Morels. Akatosh is common in Skyrim because of the imperialization of Tamriel, but prior to Elysia's rise, there was only Alduin in the north. While these two iterations, Alduin and Auriel, have their own mythos, they would both be considered Anuic gods, inherently opposed to this abominable creation that is the mortal realm. In the case of Alduin, we have a devourer of worlds, a herald of Armageddon. With Auriel, we have purity incarnate a son of Aetherius, who yearns to escape from the trap of mortality, to spread his magnificent wings and soar back to the heavens from whence he came. They both wish to see the Mundus end. If Akatosh is but another name for this same original spirit, then why would he seek to preserve the mortal realm? Why not let it be devoured? And why impose the Kalpic Cycles, only to have the same Padmaic nightmare repeat endlessly? That is the madness of Akatosh. But if you've been watching my content for long, then you'll likely know my explanation for this cognitive dissonance. I believe Akatosh is a facade, a pleasing cosmopolitan visage, made to appease the masses, whether round or pointy-eared. When Saint Alicia founded the Religion of the Eight Divines, she left out Shaw, the chief of the Nordic Pantheon. Shaw, or Lorcan as he is known to the elves, is a god of men, and an insult to both Auriel and the elves who remained in Cyrodiil. So, Alicia renamed him Shazar, and made him a minor deity. But she took the key elements of Nordic Shaw, and placed them alongside Auriel, creating a two-headed god, Akatosh. 
under the guise of Akatosh, the chief of both the Nordic and Ultima religions would be revered. This would cause major problems down the line, dragon-breaking problems. And if you'd like more information on that, I'll leave a link to my video on the Simeon prophet Maruk in the description. But with all this in mind, it should not be taken as a coincidence that when you see depictions of Akatosh in the Empire, you will most commonly see a two-headed figure, with the head of a dragon and the head of a man. And in combining these two opposing forces, Alicia had unwittingly recreated the primordial interplay that gave colour and contradiction to the Orbis. Like Anu and Padamai in their universal conflict, this yin and yang was reforged within Akatosh. So what is the significance of that? Well, if we look at all the manifestations of the Dragonborn, whether Nordic or Imperial, there is one similarity they all share, and that is that they serve the realm. Their power is always destined to be used in the preservation and protection of Lorcan's divine creation, the Mundex Tereen. Excluding Mirak, the next to possess the dragon blood was the slave queen Alicia. Trials of Saint Alicia states, Akatosh made a covenant with Alicia in those days so long ago. He gathered the tangled skeins of oblivion, and knit them fast with the bloody sinews of his heart, and gave them to Elysia, saying, This shall be my token to you, that so long as your blood and oath hold true, yet so shall my blood and oath be true to you. This token shall be the amulet of kings, and the covenant shall be made between us, for I am the king of spirits, and you are the queen of mortals. As you shall stand witness for all mortal flesh, so shall I stand witness for all immortal spirits. And Akatosh drew from his breast a burning handful of his heart's blood, and he gave it into Alicia's hand, saying, This shall also be a token to you of our joined blood and pledged faith. So long as you and your descendants shall wear the amulet of kings, then shall this dragon fire burn, an eternal flame, as a sign to all men and gods of our faithfulness. So long as the dragon fire shall burn, to you and to all generations, I swear that my heart's blood shall hold fast the gates of oblivion. So long as the blood of the dragon runs strong in her rulers, the glory of the empire shall extend in unbroken years. But should the dragon fires fail, and should no heir of our joined blood wear the amulet of kings, then shall the empire descend into darkness, and the demon lords of misrule shall govern the land. This heart Akatosh speaks of is not the heart of Auriel. It is not the heart of the World Eater. It is the heart of Lorcan. And the Kimel Adabal, the scarlet-hued gem encased within the Amulet of Kings, is imbued with the divine power of Lorcan's blood. The poem titled Kim El Adabal, a ballad, reads, When Akatosh slew Lorcan, he ripped his heart right out, hurled it across Tamriel, and the heart was heard to shout. Red Diamond, Red Diamond, the heart and soul of men. Red Diamond, Red Diamond, protect us till the end. The laughing heart sprayed blood afar, a gout on Sirid fell, and like a dart shot to its mark, down in an alien well. Magicka fused the Lorcan blood to crystal red and strong, then wild elves cut and polished it down to Kimel Adabal. It was sure Lorcan who liberated the human slaves from the alien oppressors. It was the god of men who answered Elysia's prayers, not the eagle king of Myrrh. With this covenant, all of Elysia's descendants would be of the dragon blood, and they would guard Lorcan's mortal realm from extra mundane threats. I won't dwell too long on the dragonborn emperors, for there are many, and by honoring the covenant, they all took part in protecting Tamriel from existential turmoil. There are some complex characters among the Dragonblood rulers, like Riemann and Tiber Septim, but Riemann will have his own dedicated video, and I already have one on the mighty Talos Stormcrown. But Tiber Septim, Aka Talos, may have been Dragonborn, or he may have been the public facade for a different Dragonborn, namely Wolfhalf. After all, the Greybeards declared Hjalti Tiber Talos as the one who would unite Tamriel, but they did not explicitly claim he was dragonborn. His ability to wear the Amulet of Kings and light the dragon fires is enough to legitimize him in the eyes of some, but it can be argued that his collaboration with Wolfhalf is what allowed him to do that. 
I can feel myself being drawn into this quite complicated topic, so I'm sorry for digressing. But what's important here is even in the curious case of Talos, we have a figure who brought stability to the Empire. And yes, while it was built on blood-soaked foundations, he brought a time of peace to Tamriel, the Golden Age many called it, something that would be very pleasing to Lorcan. Martin Septim was the last of these noteworthy Dragonblood rulers, and he is best known for sacrificing himself, smashing the Amulet of Kings to transform into a shining avatar of Akatosh, and defeat Mayrim's Dagon. But once again, I pose the question to you, who benefits from this crucial event? Whose divine intervention was it? Yes, Martin manifested as a dragon, exactly what you'd expect an avatar of the Time Dragon to look like. But why would Lorcan drop the masquerade now? He's made no effort to receive recognition for his deeds under the name Akatosh prior to this point. Why would that suddenly change at the ultimate moment of the Oblivion Crisis? We could also give honourable mention to Mankar Cameron when talking about other Dragonborns, but he is an outlier, for you could argue that he usurped these powers by altering his genetics. In his commentaries, he writes of using Mehrun's razor on his own flesh. Offering myself to that daybreak allowed the girdle of grace to contain me. When my voice returned, it spoke with another tongue. After three nights, I could speak fire. Mankar's motives do not align with the traditional motives of a dragonborn, but he was never blessed with the blood, he stole it, if he had it at all. That leaves two crucial dragonborns, the first and the last, and not even a bearer of the dragon blood can relinquish the inexorable burden of prophecy. Merak abandoned his fate in favour of forbidden knowledge, and so the wheel turned upon the last dragonborn. Without Marak's support in the Dragon War, the ancient Nordic heroes were left with no alternative but to cast Alduin forward in time. It was a temporary solution, and the weight of the world would have to fall upon the shoulders of another. While Marak hid from his fate in the literary labyrinth of Apocrypha, the loom of fate spun a new reality, and Marak's successor was foretold by the prophecy of the Dragonborn. When misrule takes its place in the eight corners of the world, when the brass tower walks and time is reshaped, when the thrice blessed fail and the red tower trembles, when the dragonborn ruler loses his throne and the white tower falls, when the snow tower lies sundered, kingless, bleeding, the world eater wakes and the wheel turns upon the last dragonborn. Alduin returned and the last dragonborn rose, he slew Alduin, fulfilling Marak's purpose, and making Marak obsolete in the eyes of the god who gave him his dragonborn powers. The last dragonborn was lured to Solstheim, where Marak's tyranny had poisoned the minds of the locals. Hermaeus Mora, aware of how fate would unfold, made his presence known to this new hero, and offered him an accord. Mora knew that Marak's ambition would turn the priest against his master, so Mora took the last dragonborn as his new champion. And so, after over 4,000 years, Marak suffered the consequences of his one grave mistake. The first dragonborn was defeated atop the summit of Apocrypha, by the very hero he had forced into existence, by shirking his duty. Whether you believe it was Mora's whispers in Marak's ears that caused him to let Alduin live, or nothing more than the weight of his hubris, there would be no last dragonborn without the looming threat of the World Eater. It would appear Marak knew that Hermaeus Mora would betray him. Perhaps in his years of service to the prince he regretted not aiding his countrymen, but he knew that his only path to freedom was obstructed by the last dragonborn. It was kill or be killed. After so much time in a realm where fates are immortalized, he believed he was the master of his own. Maybe he even came to the realization that avoiding his fate would lead to his downfall, and wished to return to Tamriel once Alduin had re-emerged. But the prophecy of the Dragonborn had been canonized, and there was no going back now. But in the end, only the Demon of Knowledge can wield the power of fate with such certainty. And so, the story of perhaps the longest living human in Tamrielic history came to an end. The first dragonborn left the land of linear time, but he could not escape the slow, cruel clutches of destiny. 
His fate was sealed long ago, and finally, bested by his own blood, Merak met his demise. And that was the story of Merak and his one huge mistake. Thanks so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing for more Elder Scrolls lore. And if you'd like to support the content further, and only if you can comfortably afford to, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. Thanks again, my name is Drew, you've been watching Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one.